Namaste. Okay, so we're back again talking about Paticca Samupada. And I want to show you a simple example of how Paticca Samupada is everywhere. Ready? There. Did you see it? Want to see it again? That's Paticca Samupada. All the stages are there. Try to understand. First of all, it begins from ignorance. I, huh? that's delusion, thinking I'm an individual, want, so that's desire, lust, some juice, but that's another delusion, that this juice belongs to me. And I don't want to spill it. Huh? That's hatred. So there we go. Lust, desire, huh? hatred, and delusion. That's ignorance. Then I form a sankara. I'm going to take this glass full of juice and I'm going to pick it up and bring it over to my mouth and drink it. See? I'm forming the thought, the ontic intention. It's not just a desire. It's more than that now. It's a whole plan. See? That's the difference between a desire and a sankara. So then what happens? Consciousness. My consciousness becomes infused with this desire, with this plan, and that shapes my consciousness in a certain way. My consciousness is not just unfocused or all-pervading. Now my consciousness is very much focused on this whole path from picking up the glass to bringing it over to my mouth and taking a drink. And so then what happens? Name and form. Now, we haven't got to name and form yet, but name is a combination of attention, intention, feeling, perception, and consciousness. And I give that a name, picking up the glass. Okay? Of course, most instances of Paticca Samapada are a little more complicated than this, but I'm trying to break it down. I'm trying to make it like dead simple. Dependent arising for idiots <laughs> or dummies, right? Isn't that the name of the book? Anyway, we're doing dummy method today. See, I learned dummy method from my music teacher, from my flute teacher in conservatory. When there was a difficult passage that was very hard for me to play, he would say, okay, we got to use dummy method. And he would break it down to every single note, every single articulation played at a dead slow pace where it's impossible to make a mistake. And then only gradually speed it up until I could play it at the right tempo and so on. That's dummy method. So now we're doing dummy method on dependent arising, okay? So name and form. Form is the uh, five great elements, earth, water, air, fire, and space. So, of course, these we would nowadays, we would call these the states of matter, solid, liquid, gaseous, plasma, and akasha, space, space-time, or whatever. So now I have a model made of name and form about, okay, the glass is over there, 
My mouth is here. My arm is going to reach in that direction, certain distance, wrap my fingers around the glass, bring it over to my mouth, tilt it in a certain way so that it doesn't spill. Huh? Remember, negative desire is just as much a desire as positive desire. See? Now I have a whole plan, name and form. Hey, baby, I got a map. My mission. <laughs> what then? Six senses. So now the senses swing into action, now that they have a plan. Huh? So again, my attention on my senses is not just spread out everywhere. Now it's focused on my, my mouth, the glass, my arm, the trajectory, huh? You see? Six senses. And that leads to contact. I see the glass. I reach for it. My fingers touch it. Huh? So there's visual contact. There's touch contact. There's kinesthetic contact. Feeling the weight of the glass in my hand. Moving it over to my mouth. Huh? These are all sensory inputs, sensory perceptions, contact of the senses with their objects. Oh, then I feel it on my lips. Wow, we're almost there. Then take the drink. Taste contact. Smell contact. You see? Contact. And what happens after contact? Feeling. Oh, that was good. Mm -hmm. That was really nice. And then what? Craving. I want another sip. <laughs> and because of craving, is clinging. I am going to take another sip of this juice. I'm attached. See? And because of clinging, becoming. Now this becomes a regular thing with me. Huh? The glass is right over there. I can have another sip anytime I want. See? I'm becoming the guy who sips juice from the glass. And finally, birth. I actually reach over there, grab the glass, and do it. And then when it's over, decay and death. The glass is empty. No more juice. Sorry, Dave. <laughs> but see, what happens in, in most of our instances is that when the death comes, then the mind will skip on to the next new thing. It doesn't really register. It, it's in denial about the death part. So we don't really register it. We don't really cognize it. But you see there... There is a perfect instance of Paticca Samupada in the simple act of reaching over, taking the glass and taking a sip of juice. So it's everywhere, in every action. You see, in every arising, in every thought, in every little plan that we have. Paticca Samupada, dependent arising. The same 12 steps take place. You can't avoid it. It's everywhere. So, what are you going to do? Are you going to stay in denial? Huh? Let's look at that. Why are you in denial about Paticca Samupada? I think it has one singular cause, and that is all the stories that we've been taught, all the old wives' tales that we've been told about how the world is objective, uh, how you are an individual and you really exist, <laughs> the I, huh? I am. Huh? There's even whole religions based on this idea of I am. So, how can anybody 
who believes in these stories cognize dependent arising. They can't. They're already invested in all these stories that have a different conclusion. That the world is objective. The world can never be objective. Look at your experience. Everything you experience is only subjective. You cannot take a point of view out there in space somewhere and look down on the uh, things that are happening now. Oh, I mean, you can in your imagination. You can build a model like that. Uh -huh. and, and our media only increases this by having drone shots or, or flying, cam flying the camera over the scene and showing the fly on the wall or fly on the ceiling view from above. Huh? But in actual experience, <laughs> all of our perceptions are subjective. Even the scientists and their crazy theories about the objective world uh, are experiencing all their evidence subjectively. Uh, when, they, when they read the dials on their equipment, or when they process the data and get the readouts, uh, they're experiencing those things subjectively with their senses. Now, of course, later on they can go and build some kind of mental model that's some, from some so-called objective point of view. But you see, that's fabricated. That's a sankara. I'm telling you, this. <laughs> once you get it, you will see this uh, dependent arising everywhere, in everything. It's inescapable. It's universal. You see? If the world was objective, if there was some kind of objective reality, we would be able to prove it by comparing it with another reality. Isn't it? Just like if I say, well, this glass holds a half a liter, let's say, whatever it is. You know? I have a measuring cup in my kitchen. So I can take the contents of the glass, pour it in the measuring cup and see exactly how much it, it holds by comparing it with the calibrated measuring cup. In the same way, if we want to establish that this universe, this world, is objective, we would have to have another universe that we already know is subjective to compare it with, but we don't. The, <laughs> the universe is the only universe that is. It's the universe. It's everything, right? It's just like this idea of the world. There is no such thing as the world. What really is, is a bunch of phenomena that happen. Isn't it? There's all these different things happening everywhere, all by themselves. The sun is shining, the moon is coming up and going down, the stars are going around the planets. Huh? Trees are growing, excuse me, birds are singing. Stuff is happening. People are saying this and doing that and whatever. All on its own. We're not doing any of it. We are simply observing and watching. Subjectively. <laughs> and then we want to lump these things all together in some big abstraction and say this is the world. No, 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 no. Each one of us has our own world of which we are the God. It's a subjective world. It only exists in our consciousness. And by changing our consciousness, we change our world. But because of attachment, because of clinging, uh, because of adherence, as the Buddha says, stickiness. 
We don't want to change our consciousness. We want to keep it just the way it is. We'll fight to keep it just the way it is. But everything changes. It's inexorable. It's irresistible. Whatever has a beginning also has an end. We have to see that right in the beginning. Everything we do, everything we are, everything we make, everything we have, everything we want, it's all impermanent. It's all temporary. And it's only subjective. See? Before you can understand something like Paticca Samuppada, you have to overcome these delusions about reality. Then once you realize, oh, wait a minute, this business of I am is completely optional. <laughs> we see most of nature has no concept of I am. Only human beings, really, or maybe some of the higher animals. But if we look everywhere around in nature, there's nobody saying, hey, here I am. There's no concept of I am. There may even be consciousness, but no concept of an ego, of a separate self. We are just a part of a seamlessly integrated whole. You can call it Brahman, you can call it whatever you want. It doesn't matter what you call it. The Tao. Huh? But that's the reality. And as soon as we try to individuate from that reality, that's when the trouble starts. <laughs> then we become subject to karma, cause and effect, and all these different kinds of ignorance and delusion. So the Buddha's path is the way to rid ourselves from this. And he says, whoever sees dependent arising sees the Dhamma. Whoever understands dependent arising has right view. So if you don't have understanding of dependent arising, don't kid yourself and say, oh, I know the Dhamma. No, you don't. Don't kid yourself and say, oh, I'm on the Eightfold Noble Path, because you're not. Right view is the first step of the Eightfold Noble Path. And to get on that step, you have to understand dependent arising. But to, to understand dependent arising, you have to let go of so many wrong views. I am an individual. The world is real. The world is objective, and so on and so forth. We'll deal with some of these uh, misunderstandings in the next episode. We're going to read a sutta of the Buddha where he corrects one of his disciples. Buddha Saranai.